evening, friends. Uh, I'm grateful to the Indian Institute of Banking and Finance uh, for inviting me to deliver the 8th R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture. Every institution must remember, venerate, and celebrate the immense contributions of those who have helped lay down and solidify its character for future generations to build upon. Principles, careers, and lives such as those of Mr. Talwar inspire us to quote uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow from his poem, The Zam of Life. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solar main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. I hope that I can do some justice today to the rich legacy left behind by Mr. Talwar, considered as the State Bank of India's greatest chairman, the father of small-scale industries in India, a banker ahead of his times who put tremendous emphasis on a comprehensive credit appraisal culture at SBI, and someone who had the courage to stand up against political pressure on his bank to undertake targeted lending to undeserving borrowers. Uh, a famous episode that's now been recollected in a booklet by another stalwart of Indian banking, uh, Mr. Narayan and Vagul. I was originally planning to speak on monetary transmission in India, issues and possibilities, but I have since had a change of heart, as you can tell. Uh, the Reserve Bank's internal committee on improving monetary policy transmission will be finishing its report by the last week of September. I should neither prejudge nor pre-announce the committee's findings. Therefore, and at the cost of belaboring some of my remarks earlier in the year, uh, in fact, in February in this very venue, uh, I'll focus on what remains, to my mind, the most important unfinished agenda in the journey that we have embarked upon to resolve our stressed assets problem. And I think this important unfinished agenda is that of restoring the health of public sector banks in India. I'll indirectly end up conveying why bank credit growth and transmission uh, are weak at the present in our country. I would like to contend to start with that a primary cause for the recent slowdown in our growth, uh, and I have in mind at least five to six quarters, uh, is the stress on the banking sector's balance sheet, especially of public sector banks. Uh, as figure A here shows, uh, using the Reserve Bank's data, the stress in bank assets uh, measured here in terms of the stressed assets ratio, so it includes not just the non-performing assets, but also assets that are under restructuring, uh, has been growing steadily since 2011. Uh, and you can see that the blue line, which is that for the public sector banks, has been growing rather rapidly. And as uh, figure B shows here, uh, these stress has now, in fact, materialized through recognition in the form of non-performing assets. Some banks which are subject to this stress are currently under the Reserve Bank's Prompt Corrective Action, or PCA, since they have failed to meet asset quality, capitalization, and profitability thresholds. Others that meet these thresholds for now are nevertheless precariously placed in case the provisioning cover for loan losses against their non-performing assets is raised to international standards and made commensurate with the low loan recoveries that uh, Indian banks experience. So if you look at the next figure, this is the uh, provision coverage ratio, the provisions for loan losses against the gross non-performing assets as a ratio. You can see that the ratios were actually healthier uh, uh, in 2011-12 before uh, the stress really built up uh, as a stress and then non-performing assets. The ratios have been declining since then and there is some pickup uh, since March of 2016 uh, with the various efforts underway uh, at the Reserve Bank and in the banking sector. Now, when bank balance sheets are so weak, they cannot support healthy credit growth. Put simply, undercapitalized banks have capital only to survive, uh, not to grow. Those banks that are barely meeting the regulatory capital requirements will want to generate capital quickly 
they will focus on high interest margins, possibly at the expense of high loan volumes. The resulting weak loan supply, uh, which I have shown over here, the blue line again is uh, the year-on-year -year growth in advances for public sector banks. You can see that it's been steadily declining, pretty much inverse of the image uh, that one saw in the stressed assets ratio. Uh, so the resulting weak loan supply and the low efficiency of financial intermediation have created significant headwinds for economic activity. A decisive and adequate bank recapitalizations, options for which I'll lay out again at the end of my remarks, is in my opinion a critical intervention necessary to address this balance sheet malaise that the economy is experiencing. In a recent study from the Bank of International Settlements, uh, Leonardo Gamba Corta and Yoon Song Shin document that bank capitalization has a strong effect on bank loan supply. A one percentage point increase in a bank's equity to total assets ratio is associated with a 0.6 percentage point increase in its yearly loan growth. I stress here that the relevant measure is usually not the just regulatory capital because there is often a risk weights problem there. It's the equity to total assets, uh, a better measure of economic leverage or gearing in my view. Uh, in fact, if a banking system remains systematically undercapitalized and new lending is not kept under a tight regulatory watch, then the economy can suffer significantly from a credit misallocation problem. Uh, in academia, this is called as loan evergreening. Uh, in popular parlance, it is called zombie lending. Uh, what happens in loan evergreening or zombie lending is that undercapitalized banks have an incentive to roll over loans from financially struggling existing borrowers so as to avoid having to declare these outstanding loans as non-performing. With these zombie loans, the impaired borrowers acquire enough liquidity to be able to meet their payments on outstanding loans. This way, banks avoid the short-run outcome that these borrowers might default on their loan payments, which would lower banks' net operating income, force them to raise provisioning levels, and increase the likelihood that they would violate the minimum regulatory capital requirements. By evergreening these loans, banks effectively delay taking a balance, uh, a balance sheet hit, while taking on significant risk that their borrowers might not regain solvency will remain unable to repay, perhaps now on even larger loan payments. While unproductive firms this way receive subsidized credit to be just kept alive, loan supply in the economy gets shifted away from more credit-worthy firms. Adequate bank and more generally financial intermediary capitalization is thus a prerequisite for efficient supply and allocation of credit in the economy. The central role of bank capital adequacy in supporting economic growth is consistent with what other economies and regulators have experienced in the past episodes of banking sector stress. In the interest of trying to convey that what we are going through is not something specific to India, uh, I'll cover briefly the Japanese crisis in the 1990s and early 2000s and the European crisis since 2009. Uh, Professor Ed Kane of Boston College uh, has reached similar conclusions for the United States based on the outcomes during the savings and loans crisis of the 1980s. So let me first uh, give, an, give my narration of the Japanese story. In the early 1990s, a massive real estate bubble collapsed in Japan, as you can see in this figure. So the dashed line here is just the headline CPI inflation for Japan, plotted from 1970 until 2006. And you can see the, the nominal Japanese land prices essentially going through a boom and bust cycle, uh, peaking in 1990 and then essentially crashing steadily all the way downwards. Uh, this real estate bubble and crash caused problems for Japanese banks in two ways. First, real estate assets were often used as collateral in bank loans. Uh, second, banks held uh, the affected real estate assets even directly, uh, 
so that decline in asset prices, in this case real estate asset prices, had an Im immediate impact on their balance sheets. These problems in the banking system quickly translated into negative real effects for borrowing firm, firms along the lines that I was just explaining. Subsequently, the Japanese government introduced several measures to stabilize the banking system and spur economic growth. Among these measures were a series of direct public capital injections into impaired banks, mostly in the form of preferred equity or subordinated debt. However, as was uh, conclusively shown in this table uh, by, uh, prepared by Takio Hoshi and Anil Kashyap, a uh, bulk of the capital injections came after 1999. So you can see that the, the largest uh, injection which comes in the form of the Prompt Recapitalization Act is from March of 1999 to March of 2002. In today's exchange rate terms, this is about $80 billion. It's a very, fairly large capital injection. Uh, but this is close to a decade after the real estate prices st uh, started collapsing. And the economic scale of earlier recapitalizations, I have not highlighted all of them in this table, was relatively small compared to that of banking sector's exposure to the real estate. So that the half-hearted measures to recapitalize the affected banks in the Japanese banking sector didn't actually succeed. They were just too small relative to the scale of what was required. I think a theme that I'll come back to when I talk about uh, restoring public sector bank health in India. Now, what implications did this have for uh, bank lending and real economic activity in Japan during the now famous lost decade of Japan? Uh, Joe Peek and Eric Rosengren, uh, Rosengren, Eric Rosengren is the current president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. They were among the first in 2005 to provide evidence that the inadequate recapitalization of the Japanese banking sector had major consequences for the allocation of credit to the real economy. Specifically, they showed that firms were more likely to receive additional loans if they were in fact in poor financial condition. They interpreted this finding as being consistent with the zombie lending incentives of undercapitalized banks. In fact, this next figure shows that if you, cla if you classified firms into zombie firms and non-zombie firms, so zombie firms are those which are weak financially, but nevertheless are receiving extremely cheap credit uh, from banks, and typically from banks that they already have relationships with rather than from new banks uh, that might be extending credit. And what they showed is that the percentage of zombie firms in the Japanese economy increased from roughly 5% in 1991 to roughly 30% in 1996. In related work, Maria Sunta Gianetti and Andre Simonov in 2013 found that banks that had remained weakly capitalized after the introduction of initial half-hearted recapitalization programs, these were the banks that provided loans to these impaired borrowers, while well-capitalized banks increased credit to healthy firms. Okay, so it's, it's this divergence of pattern that is important, which is that the undercapitalized banks evergreen, whereas the well-capitalized banks increase credit to healthy firms. These authors estimated that the credit supply to healthy firms in Japan could have been 2.5 times higher in 1998 if banks had been recapitalized efficiently. Okay, effectively, the counterfactual exercise is that Suppose with a stroke of, uh, at the stroke of midnight, you recapitalized all your undercapitalized banks to become well capitalized. Then the assumption is that they would lend the way that the well capitalized banks were lending before the stroke of midnight. And now you can estimate, therefore, what would be the additional credit growth that the healthy firms could have received. Uh, of course, this didn't happen until uh, 2002. So in turn, this misallocation of loans translated into significant negative effects for the real economy in Japan. Because zombie lending kept distressed borrowers alive artificially, the respective labor and supply markets remained congested. For example, product market prices were depressed and market wages remained high. Sectoral capacity utilization in Japan also remained low which destroyed the pricing power and attractiveness of investments for healthy firms competing in these same sectors. Ricardo Caballero, Takio Hoshi, and Anil Kashyap showed that as a result of these negative spillovers onto healthy firms in these uh, zombie 
uh, sectors. Uh, healthy firms which were operating in uh, sectors with a high prevalence of zombie firms had lower employment and investment growth during this last decade than healthy firms in those sectors where the presence of zombie firms was not very high. They estimated that due to the rise in the number of zombie firms, typical healthy firm in the sectors, for example in the real estate industry, experienced a 9.5% loss in employment and a whopping 28.4% loss in investment during the Japanese crisis period. So the costs of these kinds of protracted, half-hearted efforts to recapitalize banks, in my opinion, based on this prior research, can be quite massive for the real economy. And they play out slowly over time. Let me now turn to the European story. Uh, in recent years, the Eurozone has been following a similar path to that of the Japanese economy in the 1990s and early 2000s, even though uh, things may be turning around uh, this year. Starting in 2009, uh, countries on the periphery of the Eurozone drifted into a severe sovereign debt crisis. At the peak of the European debt crisis in 2012, anxiety over excessive levels of European periphery debt uh, were such that uh, the spreads on the government bonds issued by these countries in the periphery were considered unsustainable. For instance, from mid-2011 to mid-2012, the spreads of Italian and Spanish 10-year government bonds increased by 200 uh, and 250 basis points respectively relative to German government bonds. So, uh, you can see this. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, you can see this in this figure over here. What it plots is the spread between the 10-year bonds of Spain and Italy. Uh, the red line is uh, Spain. The blue line is Italy. And what is plotted here is the 10-year gap between Spanish and German bonds, or the Italian and the German bonds. And what you can see here is that it's a one-way trajectory uh, upwards. And at its peak, in fact, these levels cross 500 basis points. But you can see they are already in the middle of 2011, which was the first <coughs> precipitation of the sovereign debt crisis in full-fledged uh, uh, strength. You can see that these are rising upwards of 200 to 250 basis points. Uh, this deterioration in the sovereign's creditworthiness through the repricing of the sovereign bonds uh, fed back into the financial sector. Uh, lending to the private sector contracted substantially in Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portuguese, and Spain. Uh, I'll refer to them as the GIPS countries. Uh, this is basically the credit outcomes uh, for these countries in terms of uh, flow, 12 month flow of banks' uh, credit outcomes to the non financial firms uh, in these economies. And you can see that pretty much. Uh, the collapse doesn't happen actually in 2008, which is sort of the global financial crisis. Actually, lending in the periphery uh, keeps growing until 2009. Then the Greek crisis erupts, and then one by one, uh, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Italy start looking risky in the sovereign debt markets as well. And then you see a very significant collapse uh, in terms of the flow of credit uh, to the real sector of this economy. In fact. In Ireland, Spain, and Portugal, for example, the volume of newly issued loans fell by 82%, 66%, and 45% over a five-year period from 2008 to 2013. However, the impact, the overall impact of the European debt crisis on bank lending is more complex and nuanced than in the case of the Japanese banking crisis. Uh, the Japanese crisis, as I said, was mainly caused by the bursting of an asset price bubble, a real estate uh, bubble, and the resulting impairment of banks' financial health was because of exposure to the real sector. Uh, while the European debt crisis also caused a direct hit on banks' balance sheets due to the substantial losses on their sovereign bond holdings, in addition, it, this collateral damage uh, created gambling for resurrection incentives for weakly capitalized banks uh, from countries in this Euro uh, European periphery. Uh, these weak banks sought to increase their risky domestic sovereign bond holdings even further as this was an attractive bet to rebuild capital quickly. The debt was risky and it attracted no regulatory capital charge. The sovereign risk weights were zero. So if you wanted to rebuild your capital quickly, 
you just went and bought these risky sovereign bonds. So this incentive to load up even further on the sovereign bonds led to a crowding out of lending to the real sector and intensified the credit crunch that was already beginning to take hold after the global financial crisis. This vicious cycle of poor bank health and sovereign indebtedness became a matter of great concern for the European Central Bank as the cycle endangered the monetary union as a whole. As a result, the ECB began to introduce unconventional monetary policy measures to stabilize the Eurozone and to restore trust in the periphery of Europe, in the sovereign debt markets of the periphery of Europe. Especially important in restoring trust in the viability of the Eurozone was the ECB's outright monetary transactions program, the OMT program, uh, which the ECB President Mario Draghi announced in his famous speech in London in July of 2012, proclaiming that the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the Euro, and believe me, it will be enough. There's now ample evidence that the announcement of this OMT program, which was aimed to essentially tell markets that I stand ready to buy the risky sovereign bonds in unlimited quantities if there is a further perception that Spain, Italy, Portugal might be leaving the Eurozone. This program, therefore, significantly lowered the sovereign bond spreads. So these bond spreads that had risen upwards of 500 basis points as gaps between the cost of borrowing for Spain and Italy relative to Germany, you can see that the, the red line, which is the announcement of the OMT program, results in a sustained collapse in these bond spreads as though these economies' borrowing costs are now becoming closer to each other. Now, by substantially reducing the sovereign yields, the converse of what had happened earlier took hold. Uh, effectively, the OMT program improved the asset side of bank balance sheets. It improved, therefore, bank capitalization by creating treasury gains for banks. Uh, and therefore, there was some restoration of access to wholesale finance for banks in the large uh, GIPS countries. Now, due to this positive effect on bank capital, it was expected that the OMT announcement would lead to an increase in bank loan supply and restore economic growth. However, when Mario Draghi reflected on the impact of the OMT program on the real economy during a speech in November 2014, this was the speech where he justified quantitative easing in Europe, saying, I'm not just going to promise that I stand ready to buy these bonds, I'm going to actually start buying these bonds in the market now. In this speech, he noted that the positive developments in the financial sphere since the OMT have not transferred fully into the economic sphere. The economic situation in the euro area remains difficult. The euro area exited recession in the second quarter of 2013, but underlying growth momentum remains weak. Unemployment is falling, but only very slowly. And confidence in the overall economic prospects is fragile and easily disrupted, feeding into low investment. An important reason why the positive financial developments in terms of narrowing of sovereign bond spreads some improvement in the capitalization of banks, restoration of wholesale finance access for banks. The reason why all these positive financial developments did not fully transfer into economic growth is as follows. An indirect recapitalization measure like the OMT program produced treasury gains for banks. This is much like you know, some of the advocacy for our policy rate cuts uh, is, is aimed at sort of saying that you know, this would recapitalize banks by producing treasury gains. So it's an indirect form of recapitalizing the bank balance sheets. The problem with this indirect measure is that it does not allow the central bank or in general the public authorities to tailor the recapitalization to specific needs of each individual bank. The gains that you can transfer are a function of the treasury holdings of the bank rather than the non-performing assets and capital inadequacy of these banks. As a result, even though there was some improvement in bank capitalization, several European banks, especially in the periphery countries, remained significantly undercapitalized from an economic standpoint. In joint work with Tim Eisert, Christian Eufinger, and Christian Hirsch, I have confirmed that zombie lending, in fact, took place in Europe right after the OMT announcement. And in fact, it is the likely explanation for why the OMT program did not fully translate into economic growth. <clears throat> 
Our study shows that banks that benefited more from the announcement, but which remained weakly capitalized, extended loans, but to existing low quality borrowers at interest rates that were below the rates paid by the most creditworthy AAA rated public firms in Germany, France, and UK. A strong indication that you are desperate to roll over these loans at any cost, uh, rather than be pricing in the credit risk of these low quality borrowers. Such lending, uh, not surprising, did not have a positive impact on the real economic activity of the zombie firms themselves. Neither investment, nor employment, nor return on assets changed significantly for firms that were receiving funding from these undercapitalized banks. Worse, similar to the spillovers during the Japanese crisis, the post-OMT rise in zombie firms had a negative impact on healthy firms operating in the same industries because of the misallocation of loans and distorted market competition. In particular, healthy firms in industries with an average increase in the proportion of zombie firms invested up to 13% less capital and experienced employment growth rates that were about 4% lower compared to a scenario in which the proportion of zombie firms did not increase. At the extreme, for a sector like, say, uh, real estate in Spain uh, or construction uh, in uh, Italy, uh, this had almost 95 percentile of increase in the zombie firms. The healthy firms in these sectors invested up to 40 percent less capital and experienced employment growth rates of up to 15 percent lower prior to OMT. So now let me come back to try to draw some lessons for our story and, and see if somehow we can end the story differently than how it ended up in Japan and Italy. In many ways, the problems experienced in Japan and Europe have both been rather similar. Both regions went through a period of severe banking sector stress, although triggered by different causes, and they both failed to adequately recapitalize their struggling banking sectors in time. Bank and other stress balance sheet problems were neither fully recognized nor addressed in an expedient manner. In Japan, a likely explanation for the cautious introduction of recapitalization measures is that the authorities were afraid of strong public resistance when announcing large-scale bank recapitalization. The initial support measures that Japan had announced had already caused public outrage. In addition, Japanese officials generally feared sparking a panic on financial markets when disclosing more transparent information about the health of banks. In Europe, introducing proper recapitalization measures has been challenging due to the political circumstances and constraints of the Eurozone. In contrast to a single country like Japan, 19 member states have to come together in the Eurozone and decide on a particular policy measure. In addition, even if a particular policy is helping the Eurozone as a whole, it might not be optimal, optimal for each individual country because it's experiencing completely divergent economic outcomes at the point when Spain and Italy might be suffering. While India's initial conditions, in my opinion, look ominously similar to these episodes, and there are many parallels with how things have played out at their end, uh, we may be fortunate in not having many of these constraints. Hence, I believe we can, uh, we should, and in fact, we must do better than what we have done so far. We are at a substantially lower per capita GDP than these countries at the time they experience banking sector stress. And a sustained growth slowdown has the potential to really hurt economic prospects of the common man in the country, uh, in my view. With this overall objective, let me first turn to what I consider are the positives of the balance sheet resolution agenda that the Reserve Bank and the Government of India have embarked upon. I'll then highlight the unfinished part of this agenda, our Achilles heel, so to speak, the lack of a clear and concrete plan for restoring public sector bank health. Uh, let me start with the resolution of stressed assets in India. To address cross-bank information asymmetry and inconsistencies in asset classification, the Reserve Bank created the Central Repository of Information on Large Credits or the Crillic Database in early 2000. And to end the asset classification forbearance for restructured accounts, the Reserve Bank announced the Asset Quality Review or the AQR from April 1st, 2015. 
the objective was to get the banks to recognize the hitherto masked uh, stress in their balance sheets. The AQR is now complete. The Reserve Bank is neither denying the scale of our NPAs, nor is it trying to forbear on them. Instead, it is fully focused on resolving uh, these assets that have now been recognized as NPAs. In the absence of an effective, time-bound, statutory resolution framework until recently, uh, various schemes were introduced by the Reserve Bank to facilitate viable resolution of stressed assets. While the schemes were designed and later modified to address some of the specific issues flagged by various stakeholders in individual accounts, the final outcomes have not been too satisfactory if you take a cross-account uh, view. The schemes were ch perhaps cherry-picked by banks to keep loan loss provisions low rather than to resolve the stressed assets. It is in this context that enactment of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code in December 2016, the IBC 2016, can be considered to have significantly changed the rules of the game. It is still early days, but the number of bankruptcy cases which have been filed by operational and financial creditors is quite encouraging. Many cases have been admitted and the 180-day clock extendable by further 90 days for these cases to resolve under the IBC uh, has already started. The promulgation of the Banking Regulation Ordinance 2017, since notified as an act, and the subsequent actions taken thereunder have made the IBC a linchpin of this new resolution framework. There were legitimate concerns that if the Reserve Bank directs banks to file specific accounts under the IBC, it would enter the tricky domain of commercial judgments on specific cases. However, the approach recommended by the Internal Advisory Committee constituted by the Reserve Bank for this purpose has been objective and has allayed uh, these misgivings. The Internal Advisory Committee recommended that the Reserve Bank should initially focus on stressed assets which are large, material, and aged in that they have eluded a viable resolution plan despi despite being classified as 60% NPAs in terms of the bank exposures for a significant amount of time, uh, at least a year. Accordingly, the Reserve Bank directed banks to file insolvency applications against 12 large accounts comprising about 25% of the total NPAs. The Reserve Bank has now advised banks to resolve some of the other accounts by December 17. If banks fail to put in place a viable resolution plan within the timelines, these cases also will be referred for resolution under the IBC. A last point on this, the Reserve Bank has also advised banks to make higher provisions for these accounts to be referred under the IBC. This is intended to improve bank provision coverage ratios, as I had shown earlier, and to ensure that banks are fully protected against further losses in the resolution process. The higher regulatory minimum provisions should enable banks to focus on what the borrowing company requires to turn around rather than on narrowly minimizing their own balance sheet impacts. This should also help transition us to higher and more counter-cyclical provisioning norms in due course. Going forward, the Reserve Bank hopes that banks will utilize the IBC filings extensively and do so on their own uh, rather than waiting for regulatory directions. Ideally, and in line with international best practice, out-of-court restructuring may be the right medicine at pre-default stage rather than post-default. Uh, in fact, as soon as the first signs of incipient stress become evident or when covenants in bank loans are tripped by the borrowers. Once a default happens, the IBC will allow for the filing for insolvency proceedings, time-bound restructuring, and failing that liquidation. This would provide the sanctity that the payment due date deserves uh, in terms of credit culture uh, in the country. It will improve credit discipline across board from bank supply as well as in terms of the borrower demand because the borrowers will now fear over borrowing because they might lose control in IBC to competing bidders. So, so far so good. Uh, but where are we headed on restoring public sector bank health? So just to switch to some more poetry. Uh, oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, the realization that we have put in place a process that not just addresses the current NPA issues, uh, 
but is also likely to serve as a blueprint for future resolutions around the insolvency and bankruptcy code. This realization, this thought becomes the bliss of my solitude in those moments. A whole ecosystem is evolving around the IBC and the Reserve Bank's steps have contributed to this structural reform in the economy. Uh, when this thought crosses my mind, I smile and rest peacefully uh, at night with, uh, with that thought. Uh, but every few days, I wake up with a sense of restlessness that, that time is running out. Uh, we have created a due process for stressed assets to resolve, but there is no concrete plan in place for public sector bank balance sheets. How will they withstand the losses during resolution and yet have enough capital buffers to intermediate well the huge proportion of economy savings that they receive as deposits. Uh, can we end this Indian story differently from that of Japan and Europe? To its credit, the government of India has been infusing capital on a regular basis into the public sector banks to enable them to meet regulatory capital requirements and maintain the government stake in the public sector banks at a benchmark level set at 58% in December 2010, but subsequently lowered to 52% in December 2014. In 2015, the government announced the Indra Dhanush plan to revamp the public sector banks. As part of that plan, a program of capitalization to ensure the public sector banks remain Basel III compliant was also announced. However, given the currently recognized scale of NPAs in the books of public sector banks and the lower internal capital augmentation given the, tap, given the tepid, almost moribund credit growth that I documented, substantial additional capital infusion in the, in the public sector banks is almost surely required. This is necessary even if we tap into other avenues, including the sale of non-core assets, which takes time, raising of public equity and, and divestments uh, by the government. The Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has recently authorized an alternative mechanism to take decision on the divestment in respect of public sector banks through exchange traded funds or other methods subject to the government retaining 52% stake. Synergistic mergers may also be part of the broader scheme of things. The Union Cabinet has also authorized the alternative mechanism for approving amalgamation of public sector banks. The framework envisages initiation of merger proposal by the bank boards based on commercial considerations, which will then be considered for in-principle approval by the alternative mechanism. This could provide an opportunity to strengthen the balance sheets, managements and boards of these banks and enable capital raising by the amalgamated entity from the market at better valuations in case synergies eventually do materialize. Now all of this is good in principle, but why am I restless when I wake up every few mornings? All of these are several options on table. They will have to work together given the various constraints. But what worries me is the glacial pace at which all of this is happening. Having embarked on the NPA resolution process, indeed, having catalyzed the likely haircuts on banks by directing these cases to the IBC, how can we delay the bank resolution process any further? Uh, can we articulate a feasible plan to address the massive recapitalization need of banks and publicly announce this plan to provide clarity to investors and restore confidence in markets about uh, the banking system? Why aren't the bank board approvals of public capital raising leading to immediate equity issuances at a time when liquidity chasing our stock markets is rather plentiful. What are the bank chairmen waiting for? Uh, are they waiting for the elusive improvement in market to book ratios, which will actually happen only with a better capital structure? And in fact, the market to book ratios could get further impaired if there are growth shocks to the economy in the meantime while you are waiting to issue uh, these capital that's been approved by the boards. Can the government divest its stakes in public sector banks pretty much right away to 52%? Uh, our estimates are that this could actually raise close to a trillion, one lakh uh, crore uh, rupees of uh, possible capital injection into these banks. And for banks whose losses are so large that divestments to 52% won't suffice for actually meeting the regulatory capital requirements, 
how do we tackle the issue? I think we need to come up with a plan for these banks. Can the valuable and sizable deposit franchises of these banks, of some of these banks, be sold off to private capital providers so that they can operate as healthy entities rather than be in the intensive care unit of the Reserve Bank's prompt corrective action? Can we start with the relatively smaller banks under PCA as test cases for a decisive overhaul? Uh, as all these questions cross through my mind, I'm already down from seventh floor uh, into my car, uh, but I fear once I get into the car that time is running out. I especially worry for the small scale industries that Mr. Talwar cared the most about, because these are the borrowers who are reliant on relationship-based bank credit and on public sector banks whose branching network is the deepest uh, in the country. On a light note, the Indra Dhanush was a good plan, but to end the Indian story differently from that of the Japanese story or the European story, we need soon a much more powerful plan, I'm going to call it a Sudarshan Chakra, that is aimed at swiftly, within months, if not within weeks, uh, at restoring the public sector bank health, either in the current ownership structure or otherwise. Thank you.